Hello aviation fans, welcome back to Oshkosh. Yes, of course, if you saw our 2009 coverage of EAA AirVenture, you'll recognize this backdrop. It's the place where we left a jam-packed show full of new designs and fantastic things to show you. Best place, of course, to start our journey through this year's coverage. And of course, as ever throughout the week, we'll be bringing you the newest aircraft, the most influential people, and the coolest things to see that there are in the world's biggest aviation event. So, already though, Monday morning, some big news is breaking. Let's take you through some of them. Now, first news concerns the EAA itself. You'll know the name Paul Bresney because Paul and then Tom have been the guys that have pretty much run the EAA for decades now. Tom Paul Bresney has just stepped aside and after many years of searching, they've got a new boss, Rod Hightower. Now, why is this of importance to me, you may ask, if you're over in Europe? Well, it's because this. There's a lot of talk now that the EAA are going to try and expand into working in Europe with some of the legislative bodies there. Who knows? Could be very important news. We'll find out more from the man himself, Rod Hightower, later in the week. Second news, Alan Klatmeyer, yes, the name that you thought everyone had forgotten. Formerly the guy who uh, started off Cirrus, man behind the Cirrus jet, wanted to take the Cirrus jet out of the company, manage it himself, privately fund it, didn't happen. Oh, terrible hell broke loose and he left the firm. Where's he been? Well, he's been working with Kestrel Aircraft, which is, of course, many people know as a British-based design. It's now possibly going to be based over here, but Alan Klatmeyer is the man in charge. Aha, uh -huh, only happened a couple of days ago. We will be the very first people to bring you an interview with him couple of days from now, just keep watching. And another new story is a new aircraft. Last month in Luke, we brought you paper designs of a new Korean aircraft, the KC-100, which is meant to be a Korean composite version of, say, something like a Cirrus SR-22, about $600,000, so that's where they're aiming. We can bring you more on that and an interview with the designer. So, what's coming up today, you ask? Well, let's get on with that. First and foremost, DC, our man Dave Calderwood, looks at the new Terrafugia design. These are the guys making the roadable aircraft. Good friends of the show, so we go back to see what they're up to. So secondly, you thought there was only one DC in town. You're wrong, there's dozens of them today. DC 3, 75th anniversary of the Dakota, one of the most iconic aircraft ever built. Oh, and the C-47, we'll be looking at a whole bunch of those. And later on, our other Dave in town, Dave Rawlings, looks at da -da 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 -da, a new Bose headset. Now, they don't say that very often. Once every 12 years, they say it's when the Bose X came out. Well, that's old news now. The top of the range for Bose is the Bose A20. Got a very cool and exclusive look at that. As for me, I'll be uh, swanning around some new metal, looking at a very sexy French number. Ah, ma chérie. Let's go and have a look, eh? And here she is, alors. It is the Cobalt CO50. Another aircraft that makes you wonder the pressure that's heaping on Cessna and Cirrus firms like that, because it has them very much firmly in its sights. It's a single engine piston, 250 knots, 25,000 feet, four passengers in absolute comfort, $650,000. Very unusual design as well. It's a pusher prop design with a canard front wing plane. Let's talk to the designer, David Lowry. Now, David, I wonder basically if you can tell us the story of the Cobalt CO50 so far. I have designed this aircraft at the beginning uh, when I studied at Georgia Tech, and uh, this was the beginning of the VLJ era. And it was actually designed to be a jet at the beginning, but uh, then we decided to go step by step. We figured out that the uh, piston version of it uh, was sufficiently performant to, uh, to go ahead and certify it. The inspiration of this aircraft comes from uh, the F-18 and F-14, which are for me though, the, the best two designs in the world. We, we wanted to have an aircraft that is fast, luxurious, comfortable, uh, modern in its production techniques. Uh, there's a lot of composite parts, obviously, but also in plastic parts that you couldn't make in composite. Uh, so we built this pre-serial, which uh, currently you can see some mock-up parts, but we have the, the, the prototype that is 80% complete. And we're expecting the first flight uh, this fall. $650,000 projected price tag, 250 knots, give or take 25,000 feet. What market do you think there is for this aircraft? It's the, the kind of people that, that could buy a Cessna Corvallis or, or an SR-22 turbo. We're aiming people that, that travel a lot, that want uh, a real efficient tool for traveling. And then, of course, all the way until now, we, we have constantly asked pilots, owners, what they wanted to see in a new aircraft because it's no use to bring a new aircraft to the market if it doesn't correspond to the wills of the market. And that's how we came out with this design, which is a very fast design. It's not for the training school, it's rather for the small business owner who wants to be able to transport 
all this payload uh, for real. If we can put some dates on things, you hope for the first flight latter part of this year, how about the next steps? The flight test program uh, is going to last six to eight to maybe ten months and we expect this aircraft to be certified in about two years um, and then start delivery, uh, the, the delivery of, of a small quantity of aircraft so that to be sure that all the industrial process works okay. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to begin taking orders and, and to, uh, to have demonstration aircraft that are flying in uh, distributors uh, all around the world. We have uh, a lot of candidates. We've had a tremendous success uh, uh, with uh, our web campaign uh, those two weeks. And uh, we have more than 500 leads. So, so that, that smells good. Merci beaucoup, David. Formidable. Okay, so we go from one brand new design aircraft for a couple of years away to another that we've seen before here at EAA Adventure, of course the Terrafugia Roadable Aircraft. Now they've got a brand new design to show us and who better to find out about it than our man DC. Now DC's of a different type before that though, the DC-3 Dakota, one of the most famous aircraft in the world. Many people say it made airline travel possible. 75th anniversary is this year and to mark that, 21 of them have flown in today and they're absolute stunners some of them. Let's have a look. Terrafusia first came to Oshkosh in 2006 with a bunch of ideas for a flying car. They've built this, the proof of concept model. Now they've designed the next generation one and we talked to the boss, Carl Dietrich, about it. Yeah, this is Terrafugia's new transition design and we've taken all of the lessons that we've learned from our first proof of concept vehicle and we've incorporated them uh, along with four years of desired improvements into this next generation design. One of the things that you'll notice actually is that we don't have a canard up in the front of the vehicle. This actually came about as a result of a, a reclassification of the vehicle by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We've got a larger diameter propeller in the rear. We've got an improved airfoil on the main wing and it's got the same sort of folding wing mechanism as we had on the proof of concept with a couple of nice tweaks and improvements to it to make the, the wings extend even more smoothly than they did on the proof of concept. Overall, you'll notice a number of features have been added to the vehicle to made it, make it meet Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So it's become more of a car? Uh, in many ways. It, it's also become a better performing airplane. So uh, it, it, it's been improved on pretty much every front. And you've also uh, looked at the cockpit inside now, haven't you, with a, a new panel? We've added a touchscreen interface that allows you to control many of the different systems of the vehicle, really interface uh, with the vehicle very smoothly in a very lightweight package. Have you driven this on the road, the, oh, the original on the road? I have, yeah. And I was quite surprised, quite pleasantly surprised with how well it handles. And really it comes down to the vehicle has a long wheelbase, a wide track, and a relatively low center of gravity combined with four-wheel independent suspension. It actually handled quite well. I was kind of expecting that it would be very, I don't know, like taxiing an airplane, much more like that, and it really was much more like driving a car. When do you expect the aircraft, the new version, to be flying, and what do you think it's going to cost when it goes into production? 
Well, we're targeting uh, first flights to happen in the first half of 2011. We're going to take this new version through a, a very rigorous testing program, uh, both flight and drive testing again, uh, to really validate the, the design. So we're actually in the process right now of reevaluating our cost estimates. We had initially ballparked a $194,000 anticipated purchase price based on the proof of concept vehicle. We've since re done a significant chunk of the design of the vehicle and uh, so we haven't yet completed the cost evaluation process so we haven't yet announced what our final purchase price will be that should be coming out next year also okay thank you very much yeah thank you, thank you. it's been 12 years since Bose last launched a headset and when they do launch something, everyone stands up and takes notice. So this morning it came as a great surprise when they announced the A20 A&R headset. Let's see what all the noise is about. So Matt, what's new about the A20? Well, we're really excited, obviously, here at Bose to introduce the headset. One of the most important things is the improved noise reduction. It's significantly improved over our previous products, and it really leverages some new technologies and new capabilities. Obviously, improved comfort is something that pilots really value, and we're happy to have that as well. And then the clear audio that everyone expects from Bose is embedded right in the product. We also have a couple of new features, including Bluetooth connectivity and auxiliary audio input. Uh, people really like that. But ergonomically, we've definitely made some improvements with the control module. By moving the volume controls inboard, we've uh, allowed people to operate the volume controls with a single thumb. We've also recessed it so you will inadvertently move those volume controls. It says that it's the same weight as the 10, the old headset, but it's more comfortable. How, how have Bose managed that? Sure. What we've been able to do is redistribute the weight so we can go ahead and make sure that it's more comfortable fit on your head as well as improve the opening in the ear cushions. You said it's got a priority audio input. Can you explain what that is? Sure. Well, obviously, if you're flying in a, an IFR environment or a more complex VFR environment where you're talking to air traffic control, as well as uh, trying to enjoy some music or some other audio inputs, uh, you're really wanting to hear ATC over everything else. And so the headset allows you to go ahead and select that setting whereby any audio coming from the intercom or from the radio will mute those inputs. It will also allow you to select a position where it's mixed. So if you have critical audio, it'll be mixed in with ATC or intercom audio. How long would the battery last in it? Two AA batteries are going to last at least 45 hours now, which is a significant improvement over headset time. And it's available in the US now. Do you know when it's going to be available in Europe? It's available in the US today, and it's available in Europe on August 2nd. How much is it retailing at? Uh, the Bluetooth version of the headset is retailing for $1,095. And if you choose not to have the Bluetooth version, it's 995. Both of those obviously have auxiliary audio input still. So, that's the end of our first day's coverage here at Oshkosh 2010. Hope you liked it. New metal, new gear, cool people to talk to. Don't forget, there's tons more coming up throughout the rest of the week. We've only just scratched the surface today. As ever, this is like last year. If you've got a question you want us to go and ask somebody in a position of power, that's simple. TV at loop.aero. Email us your question. We'll go and find out what the answer is. So, Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you tomorrow.